In other words, as David puts it, quote, combine old age, pre-existing health conditions, pneumonia, invasive ventilation, and powerful drugs, and you have a recipe for another iatrogenic disaster, end quote. Hey guys, Shane from the Vanu Podcast here. Got another video for you today. Uh, this one an excerpt from a recent live stream. Uh, herein I lay out some points I feel are worth discussing uh, that I came across in my research on the alleged uh, coronavirus uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I've been doing a lot of research on it, and uh, today I've been uh, basically uh, yeah, doing a lot of research and also live streams, and now I'm uh, you know pulling out excerpts that I think are important. So uh, please like, share, and subscribe, and consider dropping your feedback below. Uh, definitely uh, love hearing from you guys. And uh, I'll also put a link to the full live stream, as well as my interview with David Crow, uh, host of the Infectious Myth podcast. Uh, so that's all I've got for you right now. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, we'll talk soon. That, uh, I came across in, uh, in my own, um, I guess, uh, research into this uh, topic. And uh, the first one is uh, the first sections of uh, vulnerable individuals. <coughs> um, so I do believe there's there's obviously st uh, there's something going around. There's always something going around every single year. There always has been. I used to get it every single year. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some sort of illness going around affecting elderly and otherwise uh, vulnerable individuals. Um, so if we look at the data coming out of Italy, 99% of victims had at least one illness. 77% hypertension, 37% diabetes slash heart disease, and of the diabetes, uh, the vast majority type 2, um, and 40%, 47% of those had three or more heart issues. And finally, all victims under 40 had a serious existing condition like leukemia. And I'll also just have you guys note the smoking mm -hmm. rates in China and Italy as well. Um, so in essence, the or at least in China, I don't know. If, I, I I don't I don't know about Italy, but I'll just just keep that in mind if it's if it's relevant. I'm not sure. Um, so in essence, the underlying condition is chronic metabolic disease, which over a hundred million Americans have, uh, diagnosed or undiagnosed. The Centers uh, for Disease Creation called it uh, diabetes or pre pre diabetes in their report for the hundred million Americans. But um, yeah, that's what it is: chronic metabolic disease. Um, so is it possible at this like well, hell, if you're if you're vulnerable. Any any mild cold could knock you out, right? Like if you're if you're part of a vulnerable <laughs> population, any small thing can yeah, and any and, small and thing can. And the cost of this too, like uh, with the, the the chronic metabolic disease, uh, well, there there are a number of them, um, but mainly it's uh, the, the the standard American. Of course, um, of course, uh, chronic metabolic disease and malnutrition can lead to a weakened immune response. So um, it makes sense, um, and 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 this is happening in you know higher and higher numbers. Um, you know the the rates of obesity aren't going down. Um, <laughs> And, <laughs> but, but, but fast food companies are exempt from the uh, shelter in place order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's, so. and that's interesting too. And as I, I, I saw pictures of this, um, from, from some folks I follow on Twitter, but, um, people are super worried about like they're, you know, getting this, this disease. So what do they do at the grocery store? They fill up their shopping cart with stuff that's going to weaken their immune system. It's like, oh my God. Um, Anyway, like alcohol, yes, alcohol, exactly. like liquor, like liquor stores are immune to the shutdown of place orders. Yep. Yep. I'll call the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yep. Exactly. <sighs> exactly. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll continue with this thought here, but, uh, yeah, thanks to me being a type one diabetic, I'm very familiar with, with, with these things. And, uh, last year before I, I went, uh, you know, keto then carnivore, I was experiencing some of the symptoms of metabolic syndrome or chronic metabolic disease as I uh, had chronically high blood sugars for, for 11 years, as I've talked about in, in, uh, in the past, um, on this podcast. So, um, it was horrifying. I was 27 years old dealing with regular, regular heartbeat and shit scared the hell out of me. So, um, I discovered the root causes and, uh, and fixed it. The point here is twofold. First off, the lower age demographic in Italy isn't surprising. Um, as I said, you know, like uh, um, obesity is not going down and the demographic is just shifting. Like it, it used to be like you know, heart attacks happen to you know, 60 year olds. Well, now it's happening to 50 year olds um, because the diet is not getting any better. Um, and and the environmental factors as well. I think we're just exposed to a lot more toxins and poisons now. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, that the point here is twofold uh, lower age demographic in italy isn't surprising um and secondly if you take control of your health and uh, remove remove the toxins that are rampant in the food supply um you know you can mitigate or prevent a lot of these issues um meaning that and, and i guess this is and, and i talked about this in, on the in the live stream on friday but um so yeah you couldn't you could say that yeah people's shitty diets are having a drastic impact on the future of freedom um shitty diets and lifestyles i guess would be a better way to put it um something that was mm. perceived as you know so minor and unimportant is is playing a role in, in locking down of millions around the world because if 
if you know if more if most people were metabolically healthy if the majority of people are metabolically healthy then this wouldn't even be in like this it wouldn't even be an issue um wouldn't even be an issue but it's vulnerable people um and obviously age you can't really do much about that but you can do uh you can uh you can't do things about diet and lifestyle um <laughs> and I guess I'll mention uh, one other thing on this note. Uh, this was an excerpt from a Telegraph article released today. Um, it was titled, Why Have So Many Coronavirus Patients uh, Died in Italy? Uh, quote, on reevaluation by the National Institute of Health, only 12% of death certificates have shown a direct causality from coronavirus. And the reason for this is that um, the way that they're coding things, if they, had, if, if they got diagnosed with coronavirus, then whatever they died from, it was coronavirus, even if they had a heart attack or something. Um, and, uh, and a couple other things about Italy to keep in mind, the second oldest population in the world. And again, 88% mm -hmm. had at least one other comorbidity. So we're talking about vulnerable people. Um, so if you get hit with this and you're younger, it's your fucking fault. Um, at least to a certain extent, <laughs> right? Like it would be my fault. It was my fault every single year when I got, like when I got sick, it was my fault because I, I, I had a shitty diet and lifestyle. So. Um, that's I'll move on to, to, to my point number three here after the after the China footage um, is the disease definition issues. Um, so for these next uh, couple points, I came across an individual um, who I'm, I'm going to interview I'm in contact with him on Twitter already, just because I think it's again, this is an important subject. Um, but uh, his name's David Crow. Uh, he runs the Infectious Myth podcast. Uh, he's got a rough draft of a book on SARS available uh, and seems to have done some extensive research on the subject. And I did start reading um, his book on SARS last night. Um, and uh, it is yeah, very, very well written. Um, very well written. Um, don't have a conclusion for you yet. Uh, I'm only maybe 30 pages in. But anyway, I will uh, certainly um, let you know during during my interview with him. But uh, he also has, uh, this is his, uh, his paper that we'll, we'll be uh, talking about today. Is the 2019 coronavirus uh, really a, a pandemic? Um, and I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, he even has an audio version of it up on his podcast feed if you'd rather listen. Um, and I can uh, go ahead and uh, put, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. But there have been a couple of revisions since um, that podcast was released. But you won't miss much if you listen to the podcast version. You'll get the, you'll get the, general, the general gist and idea uh, for sure. Uh, so um, for the coronavirus, we're not talking about SARS here. We're talking about right now what's going on. Um, so until January 19th, um, you're diagnosed as a, uh, as a suspected patient if you had all of the following, like the, all, all three of these things. So, quote, fever with or without recorded temperature, end quote. So fever with or without recorded temperature. So basically, if the, if the doctor looked at you, maybe felt your face, your face might have been a little warm, but you didn't have a, fe like a, t a fever temperature-wise, they could, that would, that would deem you. So it's basically just a subjective clinical um, diagnosis um, for that first one. So it's purely subjective. The second one, radiographic e evidence of pneumonia. Um, fair enough. You know, if, if that's, that seems fair. Well, um, as David Crow notes, um, the guy who wrote this paper, quote, um, this can occur without illness, as was seen in a 10-year-old boy with no clinical symptoms. He was diagnosed with pneumonia despite this. And now the third criteria, low or normal white blood cell counts or low lymphocyte count. So low or normal white blood cell count. So let's go over this again. <laughs> and this low, is we're talking low, about China. Low or normal. We're talking about China here, okay? So like this isn't a, this isn't a, a smack against this is yeah, this is regarding China. Um so yeah, again, I'll go over these, go over these. Fever with or without recorded temperature, purely subjective up to, you know, clinical diagnosis. Um radiographic evidence of pneumonia, which again doesn't might all it might not always um, or I mean I, I don't know what's um, the difference between like uh, pneumonia would look like and maybe if maybe like a heavy smoker I don't know what the difference the, the difference between those things would look like um, so <clears throat> I don't know anyway that's the second criteria and the third one low or normal white blood cell count so um, basically <laughs> I don't know like it, it's it's so broad um, it's it's the way that I think about it is you know it's akin to government the way the government <laughs> writes laws they make them super broad and open to interpretation um they're subjective mm -hmm. it's not scientific at all um in my opinion like did those three things it's it's just all down to a subjective clinical diagnosis um and that's uh, something that he talks about uh, david crow talks about 80 percent false positive rate with asymptomatic individuals and again we're, we're back to china here uh so in a later section uh he highlights a uh, chinese paper uh, that was released, which revealed an 80% false positive rate in asymptomatic <laughs> individuals from China at the beginning of the pandemic. Remember, these are the alleged super spreaders, okay? The asymptomatic individuals who, you know, can infect 
50, 60 people before. Well, they won't even know that they're, they don't, won't even know it because they'll be asymptomatic. <clears throat> so let me get to the point here. So I will read uh, just a little bit here. Um, starting at, uh, for, I guess, uh, starting here, it's a uh, false negatives, a uh, big problem. Um, and obviously I recommend reading this entire thing or listening to it. Um, we're just going to read a short excerpt from it here. According to an article in the South China Morning Post, Li Yan, head of the Diagnostic Center at the People's Hospital of Wuhan University, noted on Chinese state TV that because of the multi-step process, at any error, uh, any er an error at any stage could result in an incorrect outcome. And Wang Chen, president of the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, also on CCTV, said the accuracy is only 30 to 50 percent. Wang Chen... Um, flip this uh, over for you guys so you can follow along. Um, Wang Chen really means, however, that the test only ever produces false negatives and never false positives. In a paper documenting a cluster of illness in positive, positive tests in a family, this bias is clear, as most patients had more negative tests than positive tests, but were considered positive anyway. Patient 1 had 3 out of 11 positive, 27%. Patient 2 had 5 out of 11, 45%. Patient 3 had all 18 negative, Patient 4 had 4 out of 14, 29%. Patient 5 had 4 out of 17, 24%. And patient 7 was the only with a majority positive, 64%. The only way to decide logically and scientifically is to have a gold standard for presence of the virus, which can only be purification and characterization, identification of the RNA in proteins. Since this has never been accomplished, doctors get to make decisions on the fly biased towards treating patients as infected. <clears throat> so, um, I guess I'll read this next... Uh, section here real quick too. Uh, yeah, why not? Why not? So, uh, and even if this test did have a false positive rate that was very low, it is not clear that this particular test is in use and the false positive rate cannot be extrapolated to any other test design. And here's the, here's the, the banger here. Like this is, if, if, if the rest of that sounds like medical, medical gobbledygook or scientific, scientific gobbledygook, no problem here, right? Here's the important part. Quote, even a small false, false positive rate is critically important. A 99% accurate test would produce 100,000 false positives in a city of 10 million, like Wuhan. And if the number of positives in sampling is around 4%, which it appears to be from early statistics, then one out of four positives would be false. Actually, this next part is the important, important, part, important part, too. Um, so, quote, finally, on March 5th, 2020, some Chinese scientists dropped a bombshell. According to their analysis, quote, the false positive rate of positive results was 80.33%, end quote. As the English translation is slightly stilted, 80% of the positive tests did not indicate an infected person. So the thing, the thing that I want to, I want to bring to your guys' attention here, with that's with with what they, with what Mr. Crow laid out, is that <clears throat> what started this hype and panic. You know, like you, you saw those charts on videos on the on the, on the media on, on 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 YouTube videos. I mean, you saw those charts. It was you know scary to look at. You know, all those cases just you know pile you know piling up. What well, we looked at the met the, at how they were defining these cases, and we also looked at you know like those initial family clusters um, that David was talking about brings into question you know from the very start. Um, at least for me, um, if uh, that's how they were classified. Um, yeah, number five, and then I'll I'll, I'll wrap up on this. Um, uh, so the number the fifth point I want to bring up is something called iatrogenic death. Um, so an, an, an iatrogenic death is uh, in, uh, one in which the treatment itself causes the illness or disease. Um, referring back to the paper by Mr. Crow, he discusses these super toxic antivirals that are often used to combat these pathogens. Thankfully, now mm -hmm. um, the, the the hydrochloroquine that they're using is not an anti uh, antiviral, um, so I don't think they're gonna like I, I, I it's not as bad, which is a good thing. Um, it's a good thing. Um, figured I'd, I'd bring that bring that point up here real quick. Um, he also ma uh, back to it. Uh, he also makes the extremely astute point: um, there is no science during a panic, and. Uh, yeah, it's kind of it's hard. Hard. It's uh, you know, just like it's a it's a lot more emotion in a panic than than rationality. Same sort of same sort of concept here. Um, in some countries, any individual with flu-like symptoms that may overlap with coronavirus are told to go to the hospital. Uh, once they arrive, they may or may not get tested. They may get tested multiple times, up to fifteen, like the ones happened in Wuhan Hospital, I guess. Uh, since the test is so seemingly uh, unreliable, and also seems to be dependent on the test taker, um, and as uh, was explicated a moment ago, at any an error at any step in the process um, could lead to an inaccurate result. Now, obviously, as we've been told, hospitals are being overrun, and medical supplies and beds are running sparse. Needless to say, these doctors and nurses are likely at wit's end, understandably. Um, in their eyes, and it may be true, they are facing this dangerous, extremely viral pathogen. And the way it tends to work out is that those in the worst condition 
you know, ones that might be closest to death. Um, they get the highest, most toxic doses because, you know, they're going to die if they don't, you know, provide treatment. They don't do something. Um, and the largest demographic hit by, by uh, the coronavirus um, are the oldest individuals. Those are the weakest and the most prone to drastic side effects like liver failure. So in, 2009, in a 2009 um, New York Times article discussing the Spanish flu outbreak in 1918, the author cites Dr. Karen Starko, uh, who believes that a number of the deaths, uh, especially those in young adults, uh, were caused, I think young males primarily, um, were caused by high, now, non, uh, now known toxic doses of aspirin. Um, the symptoms would have been uh, hard to distinguish from the flu. Um, in the SARS outbreak, the culprit was the antiviral ribavirin. Um, now this excerpt um, from David Crow's uh, paper I think uh, kind of uh, put, puts it real nicely. Quote, these drugs are sometimes described as experimental, but that is a misnomer and disguises the fact that they are not used in the context of science. <clears throat> it is clearly not science when there is no placebo, no blinding, and no randomization. It is likely that sicker patients will be prescribed untested drugs. If they have a health decline, it will be blamed on the virus, and nobody could know what, uh, what would have happened if they had received standard medical treatment for their symptoms. If the patient survives, it will likely be considered a success and is worth millions or more in public relations to an antiviral drug that is not yet found to market, end quote. So the idea here is we talked about the very wide, broad criteria for people to be diagnosed with coronavirus or to be treated as such. <clears throat> so, like, just say you have, like, norm normal pneumonia. The, the, um, so there, there are different ways to treat these things, right? Like, bacterial pneumonia is treated differently than viral pneumonia. Um, and, you know, these different infections are treated differently with different drugs. Well, if, you, if you're in there with... Um, um, I don't know, bacterial pneumonia, and they treat you like you're a, um, and they, they intubate you because they think that you have coronavirus. I mean, they've, they've done, they've done harm to you. <laughs> they stuck a, they stuck a tube down your throat. <laughs> um, they have done harm. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying, they, not saying that's happened, I'm just using that as an example. Uh, um, but that's, that's the idea here is that, this, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the idea. Is, is this very wide I, criteria? I, people that may not have been, may may not have had it, may have been treated as such, and it could have, it could have led to um, um, more harmful results. Due to the panic and hysteria, some deaths attributed to coronavirus in Italy and elsewhere aren't actually due to COVID, but are rather due to overtreatments or just bad classification, uh -huh. inaccurate classification, um, and uh, inaccurate di uh, clinical diagnoses. Um, so to conclu conclude this point, I obviously don't have hope in the healthcare system, um, especially socialist ones like Italy. Um, well, well, not that ours isn't, not that ours, not that the one in America is not either. But I mean, it's all it's all centrally it's all centrally planned socialist, communist, whatever you want to call it. I mean, though that's what that's what we're looking at here. <laughs> um, so, and I especially don't have hope in the healthcare system now that I I guess since I, since I realized that most doc some doctors and nurses don't even know the difference between type one and type two diabetes. So um, when I realized that, you know. Fuck him, I'll figure it out myself. Like, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, in other words, as David puts it, quote, combine old age, pre existing health conditions, pneumonia, invasive ventilation, and powerful drugs, and you have a recipe for another iatrogenic disaster, end quote. Um, anyway, so, so number six, and this is just uh, wrapping up. Uh, uh, wrap, wrapping up. Um, so this is the point where you're probably asking, you're probably looking for some conclusions. But uh, unfortunately, all we really have is speculation, as we've discussed. <laughs> so did the drill go live? Did the boys at John Hopkins, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the WHO, CDC of U.S. and China um, just see an opportunity to try out the exercise for real? Are they just openly putting their plans out now? Yeah, they are. We know that, but I don't know if that's the explanation for this. Mm -hmm. um, or is it simply to blame for a? Is it simply the blame for a controlled economic collapse? Um, I really don't know, but I'm, I've got my speculation. We've gone into a little bit of it this episode. Um, but what I do know, though, is that the American, is that American and world governments are seizing the opportunity to implement unprecedented draconian measures, seemingly lockstep with the main agendas that have been pushed as of late. So the cashless society. Um, cash is dirty, after all. 1984-type uh, surveillance. <laughs> Got to be able to enforce quarantines and, and find out if people have been in contact with someone who might be infected, right? Um, mass dependence on the state by shutting mm -hmm. down the entire fucking economy. Uh, severe restriction on freedom of movement, etc. I mean, the entire world is essentially on lockdown. Um, the world economy is crashing. People are terrified of their coronavirus. And at some point in this, lock at some point in this lockdown or quarantine, people will snap and be ready for any solution that is offered. And I bet the state and the central bankers have something figured out, probably much in line with the aforementioned agendas. <clears throat> Some individuals I know in my personal life are untouched by the economic collapse and the, and, uh, the virus right now. And for me, for the most part, that's, that's, that's the same. Um, but these others aren't really paying, it, paying much mind to it. 
and likely just expect everything to go back to normal soon. A couple weeks, quarantine will be over. We'll go back to our daily lives. That's not how this works. It's not how this works, especially not after they have the entire goddamn population holed up in their houses. <laughs> you know? It's not going to go backwards. It's going to go forwards. Now, well, I'm not convinced about, uh, well, I'm not concerned about the virus, uh, con concerned about the virus. That's not what's in the cards. Um, watch the press conferences by de Blasio or Cuomo. Hear the rhetoric po uh, posited by figureheads and other politicians. Um, they view this as another war. Um, recall the couple American, uh, event, the couple American event to a one participants who were at the very end, who were talking about war footing and martial plans. Um, and the last big war is still ongoing 19 some years later. Now, with the war on terror, most people could be uh, could be deemed potential terrorists, but most is not enough for these authoritarian psychopaths. Now, we'll have to have the war on bioterror. Everyone can be a carrier, and without even knowing it themselves. So credit to Jason Burmis and James Corbett, an apt uh, for this apt equation for what's currently uh, currently transpiring. It's 1929 meets 1984 meets 9/11. As this pandemic unfolds, keep comparing the forthcoming details to those in Event, to, event 201. It's as if it's being followed like a script. So I'll conclude with a, te with a text from a meme I was recently uh, inspired to make. Quote, when it comes to this state, the most murderous enterprise to ever exist, it's not about health or safety. It's about control. It's critical that you understand this.